What we're doing is we're gonna see if it's truly 14 miles from one end of town to the other in Sitka. I've lived here over 20 years and I've never done it before. Sitka is insanely beautiful. Paradise. Sitka is a tourist town and we get a lot of tourists saying the same things. Now, this is the longest stretch of time that we've been here since we left 29 years ago. Things seem to be more depressed. A lot of things happened uh, since the pulp mill closed. I see some of the people that used to have good jobs don't have the good jobs anymore. Because we live on an island here, and we don't live one place and then drive, you know, an hour away to go to work and then come back to our house. No, we all live right here. We bump into each other all the time, for better or worse. It seems like there are two groups of people here in Sitka, those who are here permanently and those who are here just for the summer. Okay. It's cold and wet and dark and makes your joints ache, but the people make up for it. Um, it's actually a pretty safe place. Like parents trust their kids to like go to the store and like come back without any problem. In the years I've lived here, I think the general quality of life has improved enormously. And a major part of that is that the community itself puts a higher premium on our quality of life, making the town look good, making it beautiful, bringing in all sorts of cultural events. It just keeps getting better and better and better. It's like a beautiful picture, but when you open that book, you don't know what kind of story actually comes out of it. Drugs and alcohol, and a lot of drawn up problems with people, especially the 16 year olds on. And there's no future here for them almost. So yeah, we're checking on what the mileage is from one end of town to the other. But we also have other questions. Is it getting better or worse here, and for whom? After years here, do I know this place? Are there other stories, details, elements that can still surprise me? That's the 14 miles quest. 14.3 from end to end, and it took us about half an hour. of good people and what they did. We thought about Fight. people that helped in our community. Yeah. Look at all these great ideas, the librarian, the firefighter, all the ones that you just said. We can come up here and we can see each other's ideas, and then we can try to choose maybe a top five. What are three words would you use to describe yourself? I would describe myself as probably lazy. I'm a gamer and just sometimes energetic. I took pictures like up here and then I did some close-ups. It was like we were thinking about the community to interview someone in the community that interacted with it. We're going to be interviewing like you would be interviewing your person. Alan's going to be the interviewee. And then we're going to show them how we're going to switch. Yep. Your job while we are doing this is just to watch. How do you help others and why do you help others? We have talked about documentary filming and getting to know things and people that we'd usually just pass right by. I heard that you said that you're a carver. What do I like about it is I get to be creative and make a huge range of things from totem poles down to little tiny amulet carvings that you can hold in your hand. I am, believe it or not, shy. I am funny and I am very sensitive to people's feelings. Okay, okay. Do you guys know about that program where you get fish in the lunches here? Mm -hmm. Do you like that? Yes. So I helped start that program because I care about kids and I think that we should be able to eat good food from right here in Sitka. 
Why do you help others? I kind of feel like I need to. Honestly, I came from a, a good family, but I kind of went the wrong way for a while. You do the things in Sika because you appreciate it and because everybody in Sika likes how the stuff you do. I like this one. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I like and that one. Four and then one more. Let's try that. Can we do this one? I think I should go like mine first and then Owen's because mine tells like kind of about the job and then Owen said his kind of tells about the history of the job. Julia loves to cook so she decided to work for a restaurant but people kept wa on wasting food. Interviewing is fun because when you ask the questions you don't really know what they're going to say. You don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. That's one thing, too. Don't. That's like the number one thing. Don't make them feel like they shouldn't be here right now. When writing down what they said, just put it in notes so you don't have to write the whole thing. But make sure it's understandable, too. You have to take the information and then decide how you want to put it and how you want to make it sound and to decide what you want people to think. Good angles. High quality. High quality. Nice content, all right? My favorite part was working all together because it wasn't just serious, 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 like you have to take at this angle only. This is the second time I've interviewed um, like a real adult. We got to get up and move around to go learn about other people's cultures and what they do for a living. Maybe it can inspire people to like do it so they can get to know people like their neighbor better. I think since they're all very nice people, it would represent Sika very well. I might want to try volunteering for some things, like Ms. Orbison, she volunteered for a lot of things. It's beautiful. Walla Walla sweet onions, mushrooms, and custom heirloom tomatoes. Poached king salmon is what I'm serving today. Normally year round, we get about 40 to 45 people on Friday. When I first got here, I was cooking uh, five days a week. <clears throat> now um, I'm kind of in charge of the kitchen. So now I cook less, <laughs> which is kind of confusing, but uh, it's not bad. I cook every Friday, every other Monday, and Tuesdays. I was um, homeless for three and a half years when I was living down south, and some of my friends were the uh, captains at the uh, Salvation Army in Everett, Washington. They were my friends before I actually became homeless. And once I had become homeless, they definitely made sure that I was taken care of. And it just like felt like the right thing to do to actually pass on all that I'd been shared. And this is my way of doing it. A homemade vegetarian broth. And it will go good with the vegetables. Everybody here is a volunteer at the Salvation Army. Roman pitted Kalamata? Kalamata. Kalamata olives. Uh, we, we're open to everybody, uh, anybody. You don't have to be homeless. People come here because they want company. This is the pilaf, and it's looking pretty good. We've had people say this is where I come to because they don't have anybody. There's nobody left in their family. Okay. If they only get one meal, we definitely want it to be a good meal. OK, you're going to start in on the salmon, basically immersing salmon in the broth. Pretty much, I'll have enough for to serve anybody who comes through the door with what we have in the oven and what we have in the pot. And all the salmon was donated. It was fresh caught. This is, this is definitely done. I can throw something together, and I'd rather take my time and serve something that's uh, good and healthy and tasty and personal. It's a nice lunch so we're gonna pray and give thanks for that okay and we just pray that you would bless our food bless the cooks 
bless all the volunteers and keep us strong in your name. Amen. Oh, yeah, help yourself to that. Yeah. I definitely gave up the drugs and went right into alcoholism, and I'm, I'm clean and sober and have been since 2009. You want some marinated mushrooms? That looks amazing. It put a little weight on my shoulders as far as the desire to want to cook for people, to take care of people, uh, make sure that they get fed. I'll come here to eat just because of his cooking. <laughs> there you go, sir. Mm hmm. You don't think about how much like work goes into the paper when you just get it every day. It's just something that happens. You can't put it in one line. Fiscal plan. I guess we could do the math. Five days a week for 50 years. <laughs> a lot of papers. And multiply that by 2,000, you'll have a rough number. I also see this as not only national news that we're talking about, I really see it as so the Sentinel tells sick a story. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Good to see you. Jade? Uh, I should know you. Morgan. Chloe. Chloe. Hi. So this is the newsroom of the Sika Sentinel. Uh, this is our editor, um, Sandy Paulson. Uh, I've known her for quite some time. <laughs> and, uh, He's my baby boy. Sandy and I came to Sitka to take over the paper in 1969. And we've been here working on the paper ever since. When I was in journalism school, it was just a given. The greatest ambition anybody could have would be to have their own paper. Daily newspapers are more or less ingrained in a community. Quite often, back in those days, they were family owned. I was working for the Associated Press in Alaska, and the opportunity came along to purchase this newspaper. There was no hesitation. You know, I'll, I'll take it. So you can see on our screen right now, she's kind of putting together a page, and today we'll have eight pages. It's uh, the first big cruise ship day, so I just went out and snapped some photos to illustrate the fact that our town is filled with tourists again. These are not good times for newspapers that are published on paper, like ours. Competition of new sources has affected the newspaper industry. There are areas of the country that are called in the trade news deserts because the last of the weekly papers have shut down. So there's a huge loss in local news reporting. So much of the stuff that the Sentinel does, like any small paper, is reporting obituaries or want ads, the doings of local government. So when you don't have that, a lot of your local information is never documented or reported. So that's what we got uh, for today. And then this is Tammy, and she does uh, the layout for the front page. And you can see there's nothing on it, and we have to go to press in about three hours. So this is a little distressing. Um, <laughs> I think we have 14 people on the payroll, including Sandy and myself. Scores of paper carriers, our delivery staff. You know, all the people throughout the paper, yeah, we depend on them. So with Kloss, it was yes. not being biased, or yeah, I was gonna write it like, like not biased. Uh, even if he feels a certain way, he's gonna nah. he's like the guy or not. He still has to ask questions. He still has to be a reporter. That integrity piece. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Be a real fact. Can't like make it up. How do you get your information about the NFL or the NBA or like keeping up to date with that? Um, as a small town, I I tried everywhere I have worked. I've tried to keep it um. Small town first, local first. Um, I, I, I would put Little League in before I'd put Major League Baseball in it's because it's important to the community. Everybody can tune into social media, which transmits information very fast, but often not reliably. The issue, as far as we're concerned, is printing and using only news that we know has been vetted and is from a reliable source. Uh, so that's pretty much the newsroom. Uh, I can take you downstairs into the production rooms if you'd like. If you'd like to go? Let's go. This is a, this is a plate, and this is um, uh, just made of aluminum that has been made sensitive to light. Yeah, the, what takes the longest amount of time is reading stories. So that's if there's a complicated story, if there's a late 
breaking story, that'll slow things down. But the production is really fast as long as as long as everything goes right. Okay. Right here's the money shot. Our goal is is what we do. It's to provide a quality daily newspaper for the people of Sitka. And so that's an unchanging goal, I'll put it that way. You're good to go? Yeah. Cool. See you. Thanks, it's not gonna like die down. Like, yeah, it's not gonna like, go away. Dive. I remember I remember him saying it would be hard to imagine Sitka without the Sitka Sitka. What's this about the cruise ship? Yeah, it's a picture of it showing this uh, cruise ship down. Thank you for watching me try to figure out how to walk. <laughs> like, it's the simplest thing, but it's been the most profound thing to just be witnessed by the trees while I learn how to walk. Our gay community, we got the right to marry and all that jazz, and all of a sudden everybody's picking on the next smallest group, which is our trans community. It just so gets me, it gets me. The, oh, there are, there have been nine trans women of color that have been murdered this year alone. We have got to stand up for our friends, so thank you so much for cheering at just now. That means the world to me. Sika has like this transformative quality that it works on you. I really think it's just like your connection to your passion is what will get the queer community to stay here and what they'll be, what it would look like because I have a passion for healing and wanting to help the youth and I also have a passion for hiking. And so sick is amazing for me. I, it's literally a place from within my dreams that I spoke of as a child. It became really clear to me that moving forward with transition was going to be the right thing for me to do. But it comes down to practical stuff. There, There is not a doctor in town that does hormone replacement therapy or um, any kind of surgeries. And then I've had some difficulty finding the queer community. I know it's there, but when I've asked around about it, what I hear is that it's it's at the bar at Mean Queen, and bars are not the healthiest places for me to be. Thank you very much. You know, the events this year primarily existed within the space of the Mean Queens, but that was just logistics for me because I didn't really have any help in organizing anything. I hope we're able to find a way to to take it away from me and create something more out of it. It's usually 100% up to the queer community to take care of its community. And we don't really do that here. Right now, where I can find shelter and safety is under these welcoming couples and individuals who are just like, hey, you're a wonderful person. I see you as you are, you know, and I accept you. They're not negating and being like, oh, it doesn't matter that you're gay, but they are telling me that you are human and you are welcome here and you are safe. Amen. Whether you are um, straight, gay, trans, bi, it does not matter because you are here in a safe space, in a fabulous town, in a loving place, and we're going to have a good time. Growing up in a small town gives you a huge network of people who are interested in you and invested in your future and want to support you. It's kind of like having a big extended family. Mm -hmm. But also, that can be a little bit of a double-edged sword. People obviously are like gonna view you differently. Like you've always been like the same person. It can be hard for other people when their vision of you shifts and it can shift a lot. When you start finding out things about yourself and discovering things that you're not sure if people are going to be okay with, you feel like you might be letting down your entire community, your entire extended family just by owning up to that and living as who you are. We did end up having a queer prom, which was really nice, just to like have a night when you could hang out with people that you know, people that you didn't know. We've made three GSAs <laughs> across town, which is like kind of a lot for only 9,000 people. Yeah, yeah, we think it's really great. It is really great. You can tell that the community really wants to do that. 
<laughs> Something I always think of is the 4th of July parade. When the Sick of Fine Arts Camp marches in that, a lot of the kids think of that as our pride parade. We looked at that and we claimed that and we were like, we're going to bring all our pride flags and we're going to march and we're going to be proud of who we are. Even though nobody gave that to us, we're going to take it for ourselves. Celebration of who I am might come later. I don't know. It's easier when I'm with other people. I have three really, really good close friends. We're all not straight and we have a lot of fun just like hanging out and it's more celebrating each other than celebrating ourselves. It's because we're coming from a baseline of being taught that we're not as good, that we're not as worthy, that we're not as normal, that we don't deserve the same things everybody else does. Pride is helping us get up from that baseline. We need to shout about how much we love ourselves if we don't want to hate ourselves. Like, it takes aggressive self-love to get up to that point of, I am just as normal and just as worthy and just as deserving as anybody else, regardless of sexuality or gender or anything. A typical night doing night audit is quiet. Some days, right before I'm about to close up, a lot of guests come out of nowhere. So you can do it, which we already did, so. Just be safe. Strong people could come in, just be safe. Day shift, you mainly have to worry about working through, getting people in and out, making sure they're all satisfied. Nighttime, it's making sure that they don't steal anything, really. But that's a really rare occurrence. Yeah. Should be good, We usually don't go like to the very, very ends of the roads until like later after bar closing and everything, just because it takes so long to get back to town if something bad happens. It takes too long when you got one person stuck in town dealing with it and you don't have your partner, so. The morning, I have a few customers, so we talk in the morning, and then I get to see everything. You know, I get to see who is waking up first, who is waking up late. It's 
rest of it. So that's that's why I like coming in the morning. We are expected to wake up fast and be able to drive a vehicle with lights and sirens on it and go to somebody's house who we've never met before, who are usually in crisis of some sort. And we're expected to be professional and provide a service to the citizens of uh, Sitka when we're sometimes half asleep. Every time I come into the, the totem, the Sika National Historical Park, it's like walking into my grandparents' house. There's artifacts there that actually are literally from my grandfather's clan house, the Eagle Nest House. Prior to contact, they say there were about 130,000 Tlingit people in Southeast Alaska. After contact, because of the epidemics, warring and disease, that number went down to about 30,000. Up until a couple of months ago, you could walk into this park just as you could in any other national park or national historical park and you'd be greeted by possibly the same person who greeted you in another park at the other end of the country. The Indian Self-Determination Act was passed back in the 90s and it basically says that any lands that are managed by the Department of Interior, if they have historically or culturally significant uh, value to a local tribe, that that tribe can then petition the agency to take on a large part of the work that happens you know, in that park. And that's what's happened here. The Russian American company was, I mean, run by forced labor. Where are they recognized in this narrative? What about the Clinket people and the people up and down the, I don't know that they were trading with Haida, but what, where's Clinket representation and where are they acknowledged for their contribution to the wealth of the Russian American company, this commercial entity. We own this history. This history belongs to us. This historical narrative is ours to own and is our story to tell. So the next figure that you see there is Mother Nature. And so that's just to represent the national park itself, as well as you can see it's kind of wrapped in what looks like a salmon's robe. And so that's just to represent the, uh, the annual uh, salmon run that uh, happens here. In our language, we call these ones tlaikatunk, these huckleberries. Our culture is alive and well. Well, let's keep on that road. Let's keep it building. There's, there's endless things that we can do. And with the help of the Park Service and technology, um, we can teach our young people so we can preserve what we have here. These are all, they call plinket, they call it tzacht. We don't call it devil's club, it's called tzacht. There are several agreements that tribes have with governments, but those are for projects. And this is for the whole program. We still have a lot to figure out. And I think that we're really, you know, we're trying to push the boundaries here and kind of figure out a better model for the future. I think culturally when we, when we simplify what's important to us, it's about respect and maintaining things for the next generation or respecting our elders. How do we do that?
a turkey. Uh, is that light enough to go in here? The, the largeness of the scale. Today is the 11th, the 11th, 10, 33, and 17 seconds. Thank you guys. <laughs> it's a Veterans Day. On a hand warmer? It's also Native American Heritage Month, so we're here to support both. These flags were made up for Native American Heritage Month, and the uh, Sika Tribe of Alaska is the federally recognized tribal government for Sitka. Things like this are a learning experience for everybody. I wish more people would come out for this. You know, we're honoring some really important people. People sign up because they want to do something to help others. Whatever the reasons are that we're having wars is not the point. This parade is to not only celebrate Veterans Day, but Native American Heritage Month. They've combined it and it's kind of an oxymoron. That's why I'm here because, you know, we've always been here. We've always protected this land. We've always taken care of our families. And uh, I feel kind of odd throwing candy because it's, it's a bad drug. <laughs> but the kids look forward to it. Find our home, love our bats. Amazing! Skeet. Oh. There's uh, the orange clays, which are easier to see, but when the white clays come out, they're harder to see. So if you hit the white one, it's, it's a free turkey. Uh, it's a community service as the uh, Sportsman's Association once a year. Yay! Turkey! <laughs> that was a no bird. We had pretty good scores in Juneau last weekend for a Southeast Alaska Trap Tournament, and we usually do pretty good in Anchorage for the state championship. Yeah. And it's not about winning, it's more about being good sports and gun safety. We don't put one in the chamber until it's our turn. Yeah, right, right. Pull. Oh. 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 Turkey. <laughs> turkey got away. <laughs> I think quilters tend to share because we all have our stashes and sometimes when we get together and we're working on a quilt you might lay something out and something might just be missing but someone might have a bag or a box or something of fabrics and they'll say oh how about using this one. We raid each other's stashes sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> She's done my, all my purple polka dots last week. That's right. So all of these blocks are made, there are about 30 different people that make the blocks and then we get together and put them together. Our project is called Quilt for a Cure and we make a quilt every year, donate it to the Sitka Cancer Survivor Society. They raffle it off. We've been doing this for over 15 years and we've raised $50,000 for people in Sitka going through cancer treatment. Maybe that because of the green and... I like playing with the colors and the tactile part of it I like a lot. And then sitting down and actually sewing, that's very soothing. A very common question from visitors and even family sometimes. Says, what do you do here all winter? <laughs> all of my dust. <laughs> either you're involved or in something or you're watching something. You're either a participant or an observer. Kind of started as a young age looking out the window. What am I going to do with my life? I didn't know. Now I'm doing what was out my front window, which is being on the water, wildlife, and now I get to share it with people. Oh wow! I just reached my 100 hour oil change. <laughs> Something else to do! Maintenance! So I'm going to untie us and we'll uh, go for a little boat ride. I never know exactly where I'm going to go until I kind of get out there and then I guess my, my intuition just takes me. Like, hmm. And a lot of it has to do with like what the water's doing, kind of dictates where I'm going to go and, you know, maybe where some wildlife might be. One thing I always tell people is living in Sitka, we have 14 miles of road. 
But if you have a boat, you can go much further than 14 miles Beyond. in either direction, to north or wilderness. south or west. <laughs> My work is my life, and I feel that's pretty special. I love my business. This is my fourth season in. It's still new. There's so much to take in, and it's not just wildlife, but it's, it's everything from barnacles to seaweed to starfish to jellyfish to the bigger things. This is my uh, hydrophone. It's I'm gonna lower this down about 50 feet, and then uh, I've got it hooked up to my speaker system, and we're gonna see if we can hear the whales talking. Uh, so we got a few humpbacks around us. Could be the whales, could be sea lions. It mostly sounded like uh, uh, whales right there. Like, I look at this and I think of like an oil painting when I see the ocean looking like this. It's just, it's amazing. Whale tail. For me, it's just much nicer to go out and talk about the area. I'm not so into taking people fishing because there's so much pressure around it. I would rather not have pressure to go out and get a natural resource. You know, it goes back to, I'm just more kind of laid back and, and relaxed and enjoy what we have to look at. This is crazy. I have goosebumps right now, and I've never seen this many gray whales at one time in my life. Right next, I mean, that was pretty amazing. It just like, Wanted to come say hi, I guess. It's, it's things like this that just... Magic. They're only here for a certain time every year. I love for somebody to see it that hasn't got to experience it before. And, and I hope that they get off the boat that day and they're just like, man, that was truly just awesome. That's the experience I want people to leave with. Genevieve, are you gonna help Daddy cook? When I was in school, I was like, I had so much energy and I was just so wild. And my mom could tell you the same thing. How do we keep Gary busy? And it made me think that something was wrong with me. Some of my teachers didn't know what was gonna happen to me. It's like, he's not, he's not gonna learn anything. But I did, I wanted to be outside. I learned about outside. Mmm, Genevieve, yum. How is it? That's where I was meant to be. She's so fun and she's just so loving to see the energy she has. She just on her, goes by the beat of her own drum, which that's kind of what we want her to do. I want her to do what makes her happy. Because we're getting back. Nico, where are we going, huh? D42. I worry about Sitka's economy. I worry about commercial fishing just from growing up here and kind of seeing things that happen. I worry about Sitka and I, I want it to thrive and I want it to do well because I want to be able to raise my daughter here and I want to be able to live here for the rest of my life. That's it. Party's over. Till the next time. Yep, till the next time. Sitka has a reputation of being a beautiful, picturesque, wonderful, small community. Magic. Paradise. It's isolated, but it's not isolated. But I think there's a lot of pain and suffering that happens in our small community. Even my own father knowing that he couldn't go into certain areas in town. There's definitely a need for a homeless shelter here. For over two years, we've been on a journey to tell stories of Sitka, Alaska. We tried to cover a lot of ground. Witness changed locally from unusual algae blooms to new construction. And we've tried to look at this place through multiple lenses. 
can't go anywhere in Sitka without running into someone I know. But honestly, when I think about it, it's like there's 9,000 people here. I probably know a third of them, and then I don't see the other two thirds. It's a town where people care for each other. We love our veterans. And when they come here, within hours, if not days, they take ownership. We thought a lot about this island community and what it means to know a place. And it's interesting to, to learn other people's perspectives. Be it just a window into a couple minutes of somebody's life or the behind the scenes of something. Within Sitka, there's all these little groups of communities that intersect and intertwine here and there on the edges, some more than others. I don't think you really can really know a place. You can know like what a place means to you and how like it relates to your life and not necessarily like somebody else's. People come and go. Those stories are off into the world or lost, but you captured them in the moment. Can moments answer the question we asked in the first episode? That is, is it getting better or worse here and for whom? Sitka's changed, and I'd say there's some, there's some challenges with this current direction. The cost of living is impacting our younger generation and our seniors living month to month and hand to mouth. And I've seen this in other small towns where you go in in the wintertime and everything's boarded up. And then you go there in the summertime and everything's open. It has become the situation even here in Sitka. Good things. We're going to get another Coast Guard boat here in another two or three years. Tourism looks solid and expanding, and that's nine more miles of road for economic development. We need to look at the real cost of our choices. The climate's changing. We're seeing it through massive seabird die-offs, warming ocean temperatures, and landslides. I like to think every generation goes through this, but this does feel really drastic. We like to think of ourselves as being very self-sufficient, but when our businesses are closing and when we don't have the dollars coming in from higher levels of government to support our way of life here, this community is going to have a lot of very hard conversations in the next couple of years. It's a conservative wave that has hit the nation, that's hit Alaska, and it's hit Sitka. It will pass, and better days are ahead. A changing environment, budget cuts, a national tone emphasizing differences. It feels like there's a lot to grapple with as we wrap up 14 miles. How do you end it? I really think you should end with an invitation to the viewers to seek out other stories. Stories of your own community that enrich and connect and make you excited or curious. That when people come here, I hope we always welcome them with open arms and show them kindness and tolerance and the ability to just get along with one another and I'm hoping that's what we will always do.